Welcome to Frontline Nursing, a NurseMinder production that gives you an insider's look into the daily life of nursing from those who are currently working on the front lines. Whether you're considering nursing as a profession, you are a student already, or you are a nurse looking to transition towards a new patient population, this show will give you some behind the scenes information to help you guide your career. Today on Frontline Nursing, we are joined by Michelle Merkvin, and she is a registered practical nurse in Ontario working in mental health. She's been working since 2012, initially starting in long-term care, but she quickly bridged into mental health nursing and has not looked back. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Hi, Tammy. How are you? I'm really great. I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm mostly excited because of the psychiatric nursing background. You're the first person on my show with that, that background, and it's COVID time. So I know there's going to be a lot of really unique things that we can talk about in this particular podcast. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot we'll be able to discuss. Mm -hmm. So I always like to start just by getting a sense of people's origin story. How did you find nursing to be your career path? And just kind of get a sense if there's any connection. I often find that there's a connection between the story and where they're nursing. And I love to make those pieces. Well, there's definitely a connection with my story. So basically, um, I decided to go into nursing as soon as I finished high school, but during my teen years, I was basically, I left home at 15 um, and then I was shelter hopping, living on the streets for a bit. Uh, and then that kind of made me want to be able to help others because when I was having the social workers and the nurses help me during my time, I kind of really needed that. And I kind of wanted to be that person for somebody else. So when I finished high school, I tried to finish as quickly as I could. So I was taking summer courses and so forth. And then when I finished, I applied for nursing school. I actually applied for paramedic first, but uh, there was not enough spots and they actually offered me nursing. So I was like, okay, let's try this. Um, and then in my first semester, I ended up having, um, getting diagnosed with depression. And so it was a really hard journey for me. I was having a hard time completing my courses, getting to class. And then um, I was actually debating dropping out. And then I went from full-time to part-time studies. And so I ended up taking four years instead of two years to graduate. But I did end up finishing. And then I graduated in 2012. And we kind of are here now. Wow, that's actually really quite amazing. I have a few questions. And if they're too personal, you can just tell me. That's sure. okay. At 15, you really, like, did you voluntarily leave home or was it a little bit more of a voluntold leaving home? It was a little bit of both. So I was planning, I had told my mother that I was going to be leaving because there was a lot of friction inside the house with my stepfather. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards I was kind of backpedaling and I said, I didn't really want to leave. It's and I guess she went to verbalize it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, and I guess she was trying to give me tough love. And so she basically was saying, well, you, this is what you said. So you don't have a choice. You have to go. You said you're going to be leaving at this day and you have to go. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back at it, my mom says that she regrets doing that. And I have a good relationship with her now. We did stop talking for about three or four years during my high school years when everything was happening and we didn't talk. So I did lose that support, but she's probably one of my biggest supporters now. Oh, that's really nice to hear. Yeah. You also mentioned that you were, um, sorry, hopping from, what was it? What was the word? Uh, shelter hopping. Shelter hopping. I was thinking couches, but I knew that wasn't right. Shelter hopping and then also homeless for a period of time. Now you're in Ontario. The weather is not ideal for homelessness year round. Were you out there in those elements where it was a little bit more challenging? Luckily, when I was on the streets, it was in the summer. So it wasn't too bad. Um, and then there were times in between periods where instead of being on the streets, I would couch surf at my different friends' houses. Um, but it was basically almost like gypsy living. We had a backpack and it was going from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And even from the shelters, like there was youth shelters, but there was only one. You could only stay there for a two-week period. Then I would have to go to an adult shelter. So it was just going all over the place. It sounds... I'm trying to imagine myself at 15, 16, 17, having to navigate the world in that way and the, the unique challenges of being a teenager already. And now you don't really have a safe space. Is this where the social worker and the nurses kind of came in? And 
Yeah, at a lot of at the shelters, there was always social workers and sometimes the nurses would come in. And so I had to talk to them a lot. And so that's where basically it came from that I wanted to give back because uh, at one point when I was 16, I ended up going into 16 and a half. It was kind of like a group home. So we had to part of we had to pay into it, but it was very subsidized. But there was social workers and um, nurses there on site 24 seven, and you had to attend programs and so forth. But even though you have all that support, it was still a crazy experience because it was in a rough neighborhood. So there was gang violence happening. Um, there was a couple of, there was a I remember being outside with one of the people and that I was living with and he was like you need to get inside right now and I was like no I don't want to go inside what's the problem and then they ended up putting us into lockdown because there was a drive-by shooting um, and then two girls got into a fight and they ended up stabbing each other and you just see so much in that type of environment that you just like wow like I'm not even sure how I got from there to now. <laughs> Did any of those moments I mean, those are pretty significant moments for anybody yeah <laughs> and I imagine that they may have left quite an impression on you. They did. Um, when I look back at it, though, it's kind of weird. Like sometimes even in my nursing experience now, when I'm seeing patients, they are kind of not that they blame their situation and they're like, oh, my God, look at all this. What happened? It's kind of, for me. I don't know how I did it, to be honest with you, but I realize those things were in the past and I guess I've dealt with them just through therapy and so forth but I'm sure it's made it's made me a more compassionate person understanding being able to relate to people but I've never been the type of person that was like oh poor me this happened and now this is why this is wrong or this is wrong I, I never mm -hmm. had that type of connection which I know some people unfortunately do mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. don't know how I got to that point but but you're there Yes. Well, that's fascinating. And so that led you into the nursing field. You said you went right into it after high school. Yep. Yeah. Started full time, dropped down to part time to help navigate your own mental health challenges. Yep. Were there any um, depressive episodes before you were diagnosed in that first year or was it just all of a sudden? Um, I it did. I think it started when I was about 15. There were some ep uh, episodes, uh, but it was not diagnosed until I was 18. Okay. And so you're in school and things just aren't feeling right. They're not clicking. You get this diagnosis. How does that shape who you see, like how you see yourself and how you see yourself going forward in nursing? Well, I think that was at the point where I was thinking of dropping out because it was becoming a lot. Uh, they were trying me on different meds and that was also having an effect on me because some of the meds cause you to be lethargic or tired all the time. So I was having a hard time waking up in the morning for classes. And because I was still supporting myself, I was working until about like as a server. And so I'd be working till two, three in the morning and then expected to be in class for eight in the morning. So it didn't happen all the time. And when I did go to class, I was quite tired. So I think that the major parts of this was med side effects and just the current situation that was having a hard time for me. And that's why I was worried that I wasn't going to continue. Mm -hmm. What was it that kept you in? I think it was just the slow and steady. I didn't want to give up. And I was like, my mom kept telling, at this point, me and my mom had started slowly talking. And she's like, you can't be a server forever. There's, you need to do something. And uh, she actually, I wanted to do, after paramedics, I wanted to do social work. And she was telling me that there's not enough money in social work. Uh, but actually, coincidentally, the social workers at our hospital make more money than RNs. Is like, that if you right? Have, yeah, if you have your master's, they make really, really good money. Yeah, okay, you do have to get your master's to make some coin, I think, as a social worker. I you believe do. that is a profession that is highly underpaid. They do amazing work. Yeah, so then that's basically, and I just tried to do slow and steady in one course at a time, and then I had really good teachers, and the um, I, she wasn't the dean, but she was just under the dean, and me and her had a pretty good relationship. And she was like, "You can keep doing this," and it was just slowly, slowly, and then it ended up being like, "Okay, I'm at the end." Wow. Now, did you know that mental health was where you wanted to go for nursing in particular, or was it just kind of fell into your lap? 
out of the four years, I think in my second year, I was like, okay, I definitely want to get into mental health nursing um, just because of my own experiences. But I had never done a clinical on mental health or anything like that. But it was just my personal experience. I was like, yes, I definitely, this is interesting to me. I've had my own experiences. I've seen it from other perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is where I need to go. Yeah, it brings a great resource of empathy, like as you mentioned before, towards that patient population, which in my opinion, working in acute care, I shared this with you before, as we, as the listeners maybe don't know, we knew each other from a previous clinical experience, and I have always believed mental health patients don't get the care that they need in an acute care setting. Such a challenge. And I think that works both ways, because I feel that on mental health, when they have mental medical issues they're not being treated for their medical issues so there's such a like disdain between the two it's it's such a divide rather than like working together yes and I guess I should clarify that I mean obviously we we care for them we get them their treatments but they're not being optimally managed in an acute care setting yeah I I just thought maybe that needed a clarification (laughs) well I saw it even when we were doing the clinical together like when I had a patient Mm -hmm. who had mental health issues and they were there for medical reasons and the nurses were focusing on the medical issues. There was no asking, are you having thoughts of hurting yourself or anybody else? Are you having auditory hallucinations today? It was not asked at all because right now they were focusing just on medical. That's right. Yeah. And I do think those pieces of the totality, that holistic care can be overlooked in the sense that we don't know what to do. Right. We don't know what we're missing in our skill set to manage both those issues in the same space. I understand that. Yeah. Truly a deficit in our system. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your mental health nursing. So you're at two different facilities. You're working as an inpatient um, mental health nurse, registered practical nurse. Um, and we should highlight that as well, because an RPN here in Alberta is a registered psychiatric nurse, where in Ontario, you were saying that you don't have registered psychiatric nurses. No, we don't have uh, registered psychiatric nurses in Ontario. It's just RNs or RPNs. And then you can go into mental health either way. And then you can specialize in mental health by doing extra courses or a program, but it really isn't required. And then I know that as an RN, after you've done, I think it's almost three or five years, you can be you can do a licensing and be registered with the Canadian Nursing Association, but as an RPN, you, you don't qualify. You have to have five years of RN experience. But I know that in Alberta, you guys have RPNs, which are considered psychiatric nurses. But yeah, yeah. So over here. Very important distinction. And I think coming, you know, people who travel a lot, that would be a difficult thing to, like, like I said, I saw RPN, I'm like, oh, a registered psychiatric nurse. So... <laughs> So you're working on the inpatient unit and you're working in Psyche Merge, both in the greater Toronto area. Talk a little bit about the similarities and the differences between those two types of nursing. Okay, so from an inpatient perspective, the person has basically been assessed and you're trying to stabilize them. You're there to provide support, to provide psychotherapy, encourage med- like admin- med administration, making sure that they're not cheeking their meds. Mental health patients like to cheek their meds and be med non-compliant or pretend that they're taking them and throw them away. Mm -hmm. Um, So in that perspective, it's very different um, compared to Psych Emerge, where in the Psych Emerge, you're that first point of contact. You are seeing them in their sickest state. And in in the Psych Emerge, where we're determining, is this person safe to go home? Do they need to be admitted? Where do they need to be admitted? Do they need um, a COU bed, which is uh, close observation? They're very high risk. It needs a camera room. Or can they be managed on a, on a general unit where there's supervision, but they're able to be in a larger environment? Um, and in regards to demographics, the one area, the Toronto area of one of my hospitals is in a catchment area that is very low income minority groups versus the hospital that's in Oakville, which is high scale people with people with money, basically Mm -hmm. people that are top end blue collared. So you see a big difference in so many aspects because there seems to be in Oakville, there seems to be a lot of drug abuse, um, 
kids that are having a hard time coping, uh, not able to, don't have those coping strategies. Their parents are always at work. They're not able to be there to guide them growing up. Where at the Toronto hospital, there's a lot of um, psychosis and schizophrenia. And there's actually like, you can see a difference in the diagnosis. There definitely is that in Oakville as well, but you just see a different demographic just from, mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot more, um, for example, in Toronto, it's more drug induced psychosis from marijuana versus in Oakville where it's actually meth. Mm. And I, I don't know much about those. Uh, I self-disclosed that when I was your instructor as well. <laughs> Rather deficient <laughs> knowledge in that area, which is why I'm happy you're here. I would presume that those two present differently in terms of their outward manifestations and their needs and the treatment? Um, yes and no. So any type of drug-induced psychosis will present very similar. Um, some patients, they're especially people that are in their early or late teens, early 20s, they may start using substances and they may have never had any mental health issues but they be our predisposition for schizophrenia and it mm -hmm. triggers that schizophrenia to come out. And then they're basically stuck with that diagnosis and it's basically like crap. <laughs> we, now you've started this chain and they're going to be in the system for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, but the treatment wise, it's usually medications, antipsychotics, unless they clear. There are patients that are meth-induced psychosis or substance-induced psychosis, and after a few days, like, they end up clearing. Meaning the drug's been um, metabolized and is out of the body, and they come back to normal? Yes. <laughs> yes. <Normal -ish. laughs> the psychosis is gone. The, they go from not knowing who you are, where they are, having delusions, to knowing where, like some of these people are, I was mentioning to you when I had emailed you, it really doesn't discriminate. So some of these people, even if you take a substance that's legal, like marijuana, these patients are engineers, they're going to school, they've got so much education, they're super smart, then they decide to sm smoke a joint with their friends, and all of a sudden they're in the psychosis, and it's like this person they've never, like their family has never seen, and they're like, my, per this, my family member would never act this way, like what's going on? And so you have to provide not only care for the patient, but their family, because now they're like, well, what do we do? Yeah. It's scary. Yeah, it's it, it can be. For them. Yeah. On both sides. I mean, the family is scared because they don't know what to do. And then as a nurse, um, you don't know what they're going to do. This is true. Uh, mental health nursing is very different as even when we were doing clinical together, there was times when I, I think it was you or one of the, um, during the lab days, you're like, you need to get closer to your patient. But in, <laughs> in psych nursing, you don't want to get that close to your patient. You want to make sure you've got a distance that you're not going to be punched out. So I had to mentally remind myself, like, you can go closer. You can make sure you're listening to those breath sounds and not freak out that they're going to punch you out of nowhere. Yeah, well, which still happens in acute care. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. There's something I wanted to circle back to. Okay. Um, and it's kind of gone now, but I'm hoping it's going to come back to me. Uh, okay. We'll just move on, I think, and hope that it does come back. Okay. We're talking about the two different differences. Now, what about how does COVID change the dynamics of mental health nursing right now? So at one of my hospitals, they, so we have an on their inpatient unit, there's two mental health units and then the close observation unit, which is like for really intense care. But because the hospitals are trying to make room for COVID floors, they need to move medical patients. So they were converting one of our mental health units into an ALC unit for medicine. And so that unit got shut down. So half of our beds are closed and we don't have access to them which was okay at the beginning when we were seeing less people present to the eMERGE. However, as COVID has progressed, a lot of people are having a hard time coping with COVID and we're seeing more and more people present to the eMERGE. Um, and we're also seeing 
patients who have been well for years or patients that have never even had a mental health history all of a sudden go into psychosis. And there's been a couple studies going around that are talking about uh, psychosis induced by COVID. And so we're seeing these influx of patients to see, but we have no beds to admit them on. So they're sitting in the VAS, which is the psych emerge area of the emergency, but we have nowhere to put them. And sometimes I remember on night shift at this hospital, one of the hospitals I work at, there's usually about 135 people consistently in the emerge, not through one night, but consistently sitting there waiting to be triaged and so forth. And it's gone down to about 30 to 35 patients in the evening. And then at nighttime, we're probably down to about 20, 15, 20 people. But half of those people or a third of those people are mental health. And the psych emerge is only five beds. So we've got people on stretchers and in the waiting rooms to be assessed, but nowhere to put them. That is a struggle, um, losing those admission beds, because that patient population, I think, again, is already underserviced in facilities. And that's actually what I wanted to come back to is that assessment piece in eMERGE. When you're making that determination that they do need more supports or they don't need more supports, that is not a job I envy. Having worked in eMERGE and being frustrated with the psych docs who, and nurses who don't take my patients because I think they need <laughs> services, do you find that that's a challenge to balance that with your colleagues? So we're not allowed to not take patients. We don't have the authority to say, no, we can't, we're not going to see this patient. The times that we, I don't want to say we resist, but that we kind of push back is when a patient is not medically stable in our eyes. We don't have Mm -hmm. suction on the walls. We don't have all the medical equipment. Our rooms are bare because we don't know what's what these patients are going to do. So when we have patients that are, for example, uh, we have patients that come in that have really high levels of alcohol. They're come in because they are completely drunk. And I'm talking about levels like 80, like critical levels. So they need to, you cannot perform a mental status exam on someone that's intoxicated. It's not Mm going to be a true representation of their mental health. So they need to be, um, their levels need to be 20, 22 millimoles per per liter in their blood in order for them to be having a proper assessment. But the eMERGE will sometimes try to push them back before they're ready and it's like we can't do anything right now like they're not medically stable Mm -hmm. Um, we see it even in patients that have overdosed they've overdosed on a large quantity of medication the poison control has says that they need to be monitored for this many hours and they're trying to make room in the eMERGE so they'll try to push them back sooner and it's like well we don't have the capacity if the patient decompensates we had a patient the other day that came in for regarding eating disorder and her potassium was a five and her blood sugar was a 2.9 and they were trying to push her back to us. And it's like, we don't have the capacity to put her on an IV here. Like Mm -hmm. she needs to be medically fixed before we can treat the eating disorder aspect of it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting um, to know that there's kind of a, it's not a clash so much, that's the wrong word, but, but these protocols, I mean, they're there to make sure that the patient is safe, but that that totality of care is kind of a gap still. Well, you see, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I remember the other day we had uh, a doctor that was, so we had the, the patient was medically cleared, but then the doctor from the psychiatrist point of view, we, we were saying that the patient had a UTI. This was not, this was delirium secondary to UTI. Mm -hmm. The emerge doctor said, no, this is psychosis. So they were kind of having a mix, um, in opinion. And so the psychiatrist was talking to the eMERGE doctor and saying, this patient needs to go back to you guys, that you guys need to medically clear her creatinine is abnormal, a bunch of things are abnormal. And the eMERGE doctor was talking to our nurse and basically said, well, I'm the medical doctor. I'm telling you that this is this. That person is just a psychiatrist. And it's like, well, no, they're not just a psychiatrist. They've gone to medical school. So if you're having that type of discern from the doctors, then no wonder there's discern from the nurses from eMERGE versus mental health if you're getting that kind of stuff from above you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely would impact the environment and the communication. And the awareness, like 
as I was saying, from an emerging nurse perspective, I used to get frustrated when they wouldn't take patients and I didn't understand what the parameters were because I would clearly think you've got somebody who's in a room, they're talking about going and buying a weapon, they're going to go and kill innocent people. Um, you know, their story is crazy, but they're not psychiatric patients. So one thing I want to add to that is at, when you come into the eMERGE, you're triaged. So at the triage, they ask you, what are you here for? So if the person is telling you that they're hallucinating and so forth, then all of a sudden, when they're doing their CTAS score, psych problem, and they want to push them back before their medical clearance. But if you went and asked them a few more questions, and they tell you they've never had any psych history, they've never been in mental health, they aren't on any psych medications, then it's like, well, you can't push them back to us right away because how do you know something isn't going on? Why all of a sudden are they having these hallucinations? Is it a UTI? Are they confused because of the mm -hmm. UTI? There's other aspects that need to be looked at, but all of a sudden when someone tells you, oh, yes, I'm hearing voices, it's like, oh, my God, it's psych. like yeah. that's the kind of story. <laughs> it's because you're our savior. We want you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, that's really interesting. What kind of... I'm sure there's a lot of people who are just naturally drawn to psych nursing. It is not my specialty. Um, I struggle with that part of care, I freely admit that. But for somebody who's really keen on the mental health, they're just passionate and that's where their heart is. What would be some things that you would recommend that they can do to position themselves to be successful in that job or transition into that job? So as you're saying that they're already at a nurse, but they want to get into mental health nursing? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways. Um, the first is you can do, uh, there's programs, there's, there's mental health programs through usually college. It's just a graduate certificate or as an RPN or RN can take them. And they're usually about two to three years in a program length. And then that way you can get into it. The other way is um, once just if you're in float pool, ask to be asked for cross training on mental health. There, a lot of hospitals now are asking for experienced nurses to come in, but there are periods when, well, experience in mental health nursing, I mean, uh, but there are periods where we were going, we were transitioning to take more medical patients. So they were looking for medical nurses that were willing to come, but also learn mental health. But I think basically just taking courses, talking to people that are working in psych, getting to know the managers, um, and then transitioning that way. Because to be honest, when you, I don't know how it works in Alberta, but in the bigger hospitals here in Ontario, they have to hire internally first. So if you don't work at that hospital, apply for that hospital on any floor and then internally transfer into mental health. That's probably the easiest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, so when you mentioned they're looking to bridge that acute with the mental health, I kind of got excited inside because I've been saying that for so long that we need to have the two of those, like a specialty where the two of those can coexist on the same unit and be treated. It's my dream. <laughs> it's my dream. Um, so I'm excited to hear that that maybe is an initiative that's coming forward or that they've worked through. They have. It's not probably to the extent that you're hoping for, <laughs> just because there's so many aspects to think about, like the tubing for an IV, you have to make sure that they're not going to harm themselves with it. Are they going to change the numbers and try to do something? Is another patient going to walk by and do something? Mm -hmm. Are they going to use that IV pole to hurt someone? Is someone else going to get aggressive and grab that IV pole? So there's so many aspects that of safety that have to be considered before implementing that it could work for a population that's maybe geriatric and not as um, aggressive mm -hmm. but you just have to look at kind of the rest of the demographic of the unit before implementing those things yeah it is different on a psych unit for sure with that safety element not that it doesn't exist elsewhere because eMERGE has to deal with the safety and the you know, acute psychotic episode or the acute mental health uh, disassociation, whatever it is going on in that moment at the same yeah. time. Um, but fascinating. All right, so when you're not working, what do you like to do? I work a lot, like a lot. Well, <laughs> two places, yeah. <laughs> um, but so, but you know, in mental health, as in every nursing, but I think in mental health especially, the empathy tank can come lower 
you are continually having to be empathic and compassionate and guide and nurture in ways that you do not have to do on a, a medicine or a surgical floor where people are cognizant, can communicate in more effective manners. So I worry about the burnout and I worry about the resilience factor of being filled with compassion every time you go to work. So that's why I was kind of wondering what do you do when you're not there? When I'm not there, I'm either doing homework for school because I'm currently doing my RN bridging, but I also do like to travel. So I work a ton, but I have always a next trip planned where I can say, okay, you know, just this much longer until the next trip. I usually try to travel every four months, three to four months to be able to recoup. And I find that it kind of resets me and I can restart. But you're right in the sense that it definitely takes a different toll on you. I always say, um, with medical nursing, it's a lot of go, 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 running, trying to get everything done. Whereas mental health, it's maybe not as much running per se, but it's a lot of mental okay. energy that you're using. Because when you compare mental health to medical, medical, you're trying to save them, make, the, make them better. But with mental health, you're almost there to make sure that they don't hurt themselves. You're trying to be preventative. And you're basically there to make sure they're safe, make sure that they're not doing anything to harm themselves, especially for people that are having suicidal ideations, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I basically, going back to your question, I always have that next trip planned. <laughs> That's an important thing, something to look forward to, right? Because then you know I can get through just one more day. I can yes. get through this week because I know that this is coming. Yes. That's a really effective strategy. Do you find that there's a high turnover rate in staffing in mental health or no? So I would say no, to be honest with you. Um, people, once they come into mental health, they actually really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that at the Toronto Hospital, higher up management was trying to eliminate RPNs and trying to turn to more of an RN demographic so there's definitely a lot more RN positions and you do see those filled quite more more frequently um, for example I've been there now for eight years and I've applied every single time there's been a full-time line and I haven't been able to get it to this day because there's just I think on the whole unit like there's probably 45 RNs and there's only like seven RPN lines hmm. So it's a, there is not a lot of RN, RPN lines, but uh, the turnover, it, the only reason people would turn over is if they don't have a full-time line, they're, they're part-time and they're not getting enough shifts. So then they end up picking up another facility. And then when they call them, they're working already. So then they're like, we're not getting any shifts. And so then they end up leaving. I think that's the only really reason that they would leave. Not because they don't like okay. mental health. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually really interesting to hear. Because again, from the outside, <laughs> it's not my strength. I'd be like, okay, I'm checked out. I'm done. <laughs> Going back to emerge. <laughs> you might, if you went there and actually had a full year there, maybe you would actually enjoy it. Well, I did a month, right? I did your, when, when you're in your training, I had my month of mental health and it was a struggle. Like it was a real struggle for me to, to come up with such small goals of coming out of your room sitting outside the door, moving desk down the hall, moving to the table where people are sitting at, but not sitting with the people. Those small incremental steps, while they're so super important, I was just like, dang it already, just go sit over there. You know? <laughs> I can get that, yes. So I knew it wasn't my specialty um, from that clinical. And you know what, actually things do change, so maybe you're right. Maybe I came and spent some time with you. Maybe as a psych emerge nurse, you would do well, where you maybe. see the patient, assess, and then you're not basically watching them either admitted and on to the next. I like how you think. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to share that I didn't ask um, with those who are listening? I think the only thing, <clears throat> the only thing I would focus on is if you want to get into mental health nursing, don't give up, keep, keep researching, keep studying, learn about the diagnoses. Even if you're not on the floor, you can continue learning even if you're not on that floor. And then when the time comes, take the opportunity and grab it and use other, other resources to get there. For example, in the summer, I do festival music. And so when you work in those type of environments, you're there with tons of nurses and tons of doctors. 
make those connections with those people and see if they have anybody that they know of a job opening. Do, do you know anybody that's looking? Can you connect me to this manager? Make those connections with people. Mm -hmm. And you did say this earlier, and I want to I want to highlight this because I highlighted in the paper that you sent me before our interview, and that was about not being so quick to discriminate. Do you want to fill in that that sentence, or do you want me to read it? You can go ahead. Okay, I love it. So don't be so quick to discriminate against mental illness. It doesn't discriminate on race, gender, or educational background. And I think that's just so poignant. You know, we tend to think it's not in my backyard syndrome. Yeah. And to just be aware that it could happen to you and you may be the one needing the services. So to be supportive for those who need it. I totally agree. We see so many nurses come in and people don't even think they're like, oh, I work in medicine. I'm a nurse. I'm fine. It's never going to touch me. You never know. And it doesn't mean that you're stuck with it forever, but don't discriminate. It's, mm -hmm. it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fabulous having you on the show. Thank you for having me. It was nice talking to you.